We're super excited to listen to Taking Your Local Network to Global Heights, hosted by Basma Khalifa, stylist and filmmaker. And alongside her, we have amazing Jason Njoku, founder of iRocco TV. Basma, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, as um, Jordan just said, my name is Basma Khalifa. I'm uh, Sydney's and I'm a filmmaker, director, fashion stylist, writer, pretty much everything I could be. Um, and today we are joined by Jason. Jason is a British Nigerian businessman. He is the co-founder and CEO of iRocco TV, a video on demand service for Nigerian movies, which, which is one of Africa's first, first mainstream online movie streaming websites, which is amazing. And today we are talking to him about the importance of storytelling and collaboration and accessibility. All those things, Jason, welcome. Big, big topics, really, really big topics, but hopefully it'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be totally fine. So jumping straight right in, straight from the top, they asked me, I guess when we were talking about filmmaking and I was like, okay, the questions I want to ask Jason, you know, what are the most important things when it comes to sharing stories, especially when you're sharing stories about other people, because that's what filmmaking is, you know, it's not always your personal story. When I made a documentary, it was a very personal story to me, but it became everyone else's story because you, in general, walk the same lines in some ways. For you, what would you say are some of the most important things it comes to telling stories? Yeah, telling stories. Well, I think it starts with the diversity of the actual storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think anywhere where you try to narrow the storytelling to like a handful of people, you end up with pretty boring, you know, pretty unexciting uh, content, right? I think mm -hmm. um, no, I did, definitely over the last, um, you know, 20 years of Nollywood, and I've been in Nollywood now for like you know, 11 years or so, um, there's definitely been, uh, you know, an increasingly expanding amount of people who are telling these stories, um, and I think that definitely is why you get the diversity of stories in Hollywood. You get, you can only get so many stories coming from one person, right? Um, right. And I think, you know, I, I must have a big caveat because ultimately, my wife is the person who engages storytellers. I'm essentially right. just sitting in the background doing the commercial stuff. So, <laughs> you know, she would go, she, she, you know, she, she would go to the ends of the earth, right? You know, she's she doesn't really speak to the media. She's not really. She doesn't really do that type of stuff. So she largely leaves it to me to basically be her sort of, you know, executive mouthpiece, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, for, ex for example, right now she's in Senegal. She's been in wow. Senegal for the last three days. Why? Because she's gone to Senegal because she wants to make some films in French speaking Africa. So she goes to the streets herself to basically go and speak to filmmakers, right? She was in Cameroon a few weeks ago. Um, she's been to like Ivory Coast this year. So if you want to, she wants to go and do something, she goes to the streets. When she wants okay. to go and do something you know, outside of Lagos, she goes to Enugu, she goes to Benin. So she essentially goes and finds the stories. And I sure. think you know, what she has definitely done over the last um, 10 years, obviously with my support in the back, has mm -hmm. been actually like empower new storytellers. So, um, you know, when, when she conceived the idea of rock, um, her ambition was essentially to give people who have great stories but don't have the opportunity the opportunity to actually tell those stories so if you look at the kind of content that at least her and a network of people do they're completely different from anybody else in terms of the sheer volume the sheer size the sheer diversity the kind of storytelling um etc right so you know at least to her to to her mind she's very much focused on finding the stories as opposed to you know being beholden to any particular storyteller and i think with that kind of diversity of of storytelling, it's very easy to get some really compelling and interesting stuff coming out, right? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the world needs those kind of stories. I always say to people when they're like, okay, well, what story have you found? And I'm like, well, not every story is on the internet. Sometimes it's about hitting the ground, right? It's about going, especially in Africa, especially the, everyone doesn't live on the internet as much as we think they do. So sometimes you do have sure. to go and talk to local people. You do have to talk to someone that's just working on a market who probably has an incredible story to tell. It's quite fascinating. The other thing I picked up, and obviously I would assume it's a primarily Nigerian audience, but for Nollywood is to me fascinating. Can you describe what Nollywood is for anyone who doesn't actually know what Nollywood is? It essentially is the curated soul of, I, you, you, you could say Nigerian, but I think it goes beyond Nigeria, right? So, oh. you know, I go to Zambia, they're watching Nollywood. I'm in Kenya, they're watching Nollywood. I'm in South Africa, they're watching Nollywood. People who can barely understand English somehow found a way to enjoy Nollywood. In French speaking Africa, once we started dubbing, Nollywood kind of really resonated with people. I think first and foremost, um, you know, African culture is very, very different, but it's also very, very similar. You know, you look at the West where there's a very nuclear family and it's all about me and my kids and stuff like that. Whereas in Africa, no matter where you are in Africa, it's much more about the extended family, it's about the community, yeah. etc. 
And I think, you know, there are aspects of that which anyone in any of the, the sort of the 48, you know, sub-Saharan African countries can appreciate. And that's why mm -hmm. Nollywood has traveled so far. So yes, it is the Nigerian story, but it also captures Ghanaian stories because Ghanaians understand it. It's much more broader than that. If it was just yeah. Nigerian, then it wouldn't, it would just remain in Nigeria, right? But it's gone far, far beyond that. So I think first and foremost, it's one, it's basically black people telling their own stories. You know, mm -hmm. obviously Nigerians are so many um, that, you know, you, you tip, it's, it's almost impossible to not have a Nigerian friend. I would say like as a black person, <laughs> it really friend, is, like, it's impossible to not have a Nigerian friend. Um, yeah. <laughs> so first and foremost, and you know, one thing about Nigerians, like, you know, our food, you must eat it. That our music, yeah. you must enjoy it. Our church will yeah. drag you to church. So anything, anything like, you know, you almost are exposed constantly to the Nigerian experience. And then you just capture that in, in yeah. movies. And then it's like, oh, actually, that's interesting. And then, you know, very I think for, to, to my mind, it's, it's, you know, it's not very often you get to hear our peculiar names, right? So my name is Jason, but then in most Hollywood movies, they're not called Jason and, you know, Dominic or whatever. They're called like, you know, Eberi, they're called um, Ayo, they're called, they're, there are own names, right? And I think, right, absolutely. And I think there has definitely been, um, look, you know, I grew up in the UK in the 80s and 90s. Being Nigerian was not cool in any way, mm -hmm. shape or form. Now being Nigerian is the most coolest thing in the world, right? Um, so I think that has changed over the last 20 years yeah. and that has largely been driven by Nigerians falling in love with themselves. And if you meet a Nigerian, they, we are completely in love with ourselves. That's just no, how I, we I really, I truly, I truly know that. <laughs> Every Nigerian person I know is like fully proud Nigerian. <laughs> so yeah. as someone who's created a space, I guess, for stories to be shared, how do you collaborate? I know you said your wife goes to the ground, but you know, once you find people, what is that process of collaborating with storytellers and filmmakers to get their stories out? So I find independent storytellers everywhere in the world, their biggest problem is essentially telling a story, right? It's financing. So yeah. it's one thing, if I want to go and collaborate, let's have some conversations, I'll support you in your script writing, but if there's no money, then like, it's just conversations, right? So I think first and foremost, what Iwoko has definitely done over the last 10 years um, has been go out there and find capital to invest in content, right? Um, you know, I think that you know, I, I wouldn't like, you know, African Magic and Multi-Choice. I can't think of anyone who remotely put as much money into content as we have over the last decade. Right? And I'm talking about somewhere in excess of definitely $100 million in terms of just our content spend. And that is obviously, that is our business, right? So we have to spend money. Um, so I think first and foremost, it's one, being able to, you know, go out there and evangelize the, the Nollywood story. Um, mm -hmm. and then go out there and find willing partners to actually fund those stories, right? And that's essentially where I come in. I'm just essentially like a glorified sales guy who's selling Hollywood to sort of corporates and getting them excited and obviously trying to get them to invest in, in the industry, right? So, right. sorry. Um, so Busy. that is essentially, sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that that essentially is, um, that is, that is the role, right? And I think, you know, even when I spend time in, so I'm, I'm in Houston, Texas now, um, I've spent time in LA, the number one problem that black filmmakers, even in African, African American filmmakers have is finance and they just don't have the money right. and no one's out there really sort of like creating stuff for them. So, that, and again, you, you know, you have, that's why you end up having this narrow uh, storytelling where you essentially have like Tyler Perry, um, Peel and like a handful of really super producers, then you have like no one else. There's no right. like, you know, two, 20 or 30 up and coming guys who've been given a chance to make like one or $2 right. million dollar movies. And I think that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a financing challenge that needs to be bridged, right? Right. Do you think it's also a financing challenge and also a trust challenge? You know, for me, I made a documentary that was for the BBC in the end. And, you know, it took me three or four no's over the space of three years to convince them that the story was worth telling. Then when I finally eventually convinced them, I mean, it went worldwide in 10, 10 different languages, 10, 15 million people saw it. And I was like, OK, but it took me three years to convince you guys to do, let me do that. Do you think there's also a confidence in black storytellers that maybe people aren't as confident to trust us to do it? I would say, who cares about their confidence? We need to build our own platforms and do it ourselves, right? Like, it's yeah. as simple as that. I think if you have to keep on pitching to people who don't, you know, for me, when I, early in the days of we were I used to realize that if I have to explain what Nollywood is to you, it's just going to be a long, long conversation. And you know what? I just <laughs> didn't really enjoy having a conversations, right? You understand, it's like, what is Nollywood? Who are these Nigerians? It's just, it's like just long, right? And I think as you as a storyteller, should you really be spending your time doing that? Like, right. no way. Like, you should be creating content. Like, it's hard enough, you know, it's hard enough creating the content. My wife says this all the time, like, money is not the problem. You can give right. people like $100 million and they can waste it on nonsense. And there are loads of like, 
like movies on streaming platforms, which is just garbage, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about the money. It's about allowing the storytellers to actually do their job. And I think um, if you especially look, I, I always use horror, um, like US horror. Mm -hmm. Most of those things are low budget. They're like yeah, one they to five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's like there's, there's dedicated distribution houses. There's dedicated financing firms who just focus on one to five million dollar horror movies, which then go onto the cinemas and then do like 20, 200 million dollars, 500 million dollars, etc. Right. So is yeah. it about the storytelling? Is it about the financing? Is it about people having their own platforms? Now, if you would have left that to Disney or Universal, those horror movies would never be made. But there were specific platforms which have been built to cater for that. And I think for mm -hmm. us as um, as black people, we, like it breaks my heart that there was only one Iwoko equivalent, right? Like right. there should be more independent people like me who are out there financing films and attracting capital, et cetera, right? The fact that 10 years later, it's only Iwoko, I think that is a failure. That's like a, that's a, that's a systemic failure, if you ask me. Right, that's so, so interesting. Cause you're right, it shouldn't, um, there's room for all, right? And I think that we are so focused on America, or we're so focused in the UK, if you're in the UK, and we don't think that actually there's films that can be made worldwide. They don't have to be made just yep. in America. Yep. Do you and, your, you know, um, I think again, it's, oh. sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, for me, again, I was going to say, it's like, um, look, it's, if, as a founder of Iwoko, you don't have to convince me to tell an African story. It's whether or not the story is sweet. That is the conversation. Where right. I find the finances as a storyteller, that's not your problem. Should I just make right. the movie, right? Um, <laughs> right. Or, or the series, whatever it is. Yeah. And I think also like it's, um, you know, and I've, I've, I've had these conversations back and forth, but you know, if you look at the diversity of stories for, for, for Africans, mm -hmm. the fact again, that there is only one like Iwoko and there hasn't been many more, and the fact that there isn't any in French speaking Africa or Eastern Africa or Southern Africa just goes to show why those movies really, really, or those series, that content really, really struggles to break out of the regions, right? Because right. there's no one out there essentially kind of like, you know, evangelizing it and raising the finance and et cetera. So I think, you know, as people, we can't keep on expecting val external validation, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people spend a lot of time, we want to get to the Oscars, we want to do this, we want to do that. I'm just like, I don't care. Like, we have a billion people in Sub Saharan Africa. You know, yeah. we have 50 million people in the diaspora. If we can't figure out a way to build platforms and make money from that, then we deserve to basically be begging for three to five years for shit. But as far as I'm concerned, like we deserve yeah. what we get. No one's going to hand us anything. We've got to go out there and take it. Yeah, no, you're, no, you're totally right. Do you think as you grow and with the change in tide of, I guess, black people being popular now, do you think there'll be more um, Iraqo competitors coming up? I hope so. But again, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, the, the business of film is very, very sexy. Right. right. The actual filmmaking is sexy. So if you look at all of the energy from NGOs and governments and engagement, right. it's all about the storytellers. Right. But in the end, like it's really about the platforms that essentially will deliver those stories to the world. So I mm -hmm. think um, the investment which has gone into the actual filmmaking, the excitement which has gone into the actual filmmaking is like 95 percent of the problem in terms of just the fact that it's going to like not build platforms. Um, right. Yeah. And if, if you look, if you look, at, if you look at the last five years, if you look at the last five years in content, there has been an absolute explosion from Now TV in the UK to Netflix in the, and obviously globally. You know, we have Discovery Plus, we have Disney Plus, we everything. have you know, <laughs> everything. we have like everything. Yeah. So platforms yeah. are creating platforms and they're going to war. There's a content war. But as a really black filmmaker, do you feel like you benefited from that content war in any way? Um, I've benefited from it giving me more to watch and more to learn from. And I definitely love the, the storyteller. Yeah. I'm a film. Yeah, I am. I and I love in, yeah. in, in, the, in the end, it's a money, it's a money game, right? It's, it's money. Yeah. It's and it's somewhere else to put your stories. Do I think those platforms are accessible? No. Do I think I'm going to be able to go to Netflix right now tomorrow and be like, let me make a film? No, because the problem is, as you said, it has to be from the ground up and everyone's like, let's get it on Netflix. But actually that's not the reality for most filmmakers, right? You're not going on your first film to Netflix. No. And I think, I guess that that's kind of the issue. And I think what's interesting that you're saying is that like, it does, you don't need to do that. You don't have to do that. There's lots of other ways to make money and invest in a film without it having to be like, we're only looking at Netflix. or we're only looking at now, you know, whatever other platforms there are. But I think it's beautiful. I think there's more spaces to put what we want to put out there, right? Yes. And there needs to be more. And I think the key thing is there needs to be more. 
Yeah, there needs to be more diversity in that. I think what I what's really interesting to me with filmmaking recently is you're watching the rise of films with subtitles. You know, if we watch all these things like Squid Game, that's insanely popular now. You know, Parasite, all these things coming from Korea actually are doing better than English speaking films. Do you think that changes the landscape for things for African storytellers? But that didn't start today, right? Like no, six, seven years ago, I was evangelizing in Africa, Korean. Like, again, we put Korean content on Iroko TV in 2015 or something like that. Korean mm -hmm. content has been big for the last like 30 years. It's not like a new thing. Like, it's like almost weird that people are like, oh my God, I discovered the, um, there's no Korean content. No, this. And more okay. importantly, there were like about five platforms off the top of my head, which mm -hmm. essentially are dedicated Korean movie series you know, films, right? Um, right? So they had the platforms. You know, it wasn't like Netflix made the Korean industry. Like, no, it's been there for, you know, many decades, but there was a concerted effort many, many years ago from the individual production houses to create very high quality content. Not only right. that, make it accessible to the world. So, you know, I think Korea, South Korea is definitely one of those, um, those regions who have a very deliberate kind of cultural um, export plan, right? So whether right. that is, um, is it BTS with their music? So again, the biggest musicians yeah. in yes. Southeast Asia, a beat at like our our, our Southeast, yeah. our South Koreans, that's not by accident. Yeah. Again, the, the 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 largest, again, if you go across Southeast Asia, and I spent some time a few years ago across like, you know, Hong Kong, Taiwan, et cetera. Again, you know, they are overwhelmingly consuming um, South uh, South Korean content, right? And another, another example, so like, I have three kids. Um, you know, there was a story I read. Uh, one of the hairs of um, of Samsung, um, they were very interested in exporting um, the cultural aspects of South Korea, right? And Taekwondo is a big part of that. Right. I, I don't know how it happened, but everywhere around the world, young children are basically using, um, ta uh, you know, South Korean words to learn Taekwondo. How did Taekwondo go from like a, a, a minor sort of marginal martial art to something everywhere? It wasn't by accident. They're right. sponsoring conferences. They're like right. investing in these things. They're going like country by country, going school mm. by school. School to make it's like the default, um, you know, martial arts for the world. And everyone's sort of like, you know, being pulled back into South Korean culture, right? So these things are like multi-decade, multi, um, multi sort of faceted plans, right? And then right. you just have one version of a squid game, right? So, so again, like, you know, we give you a perfect example. So Slumdog Millionaire was a fantastic yeah. one, Oscar movies, et cetera. Is that the definition of the Indian film market? Of course not. Like, no. and it has, has, has it happened since then? Um, actually it has with Dangal and uh, Bahub yeah, yeah. Uh, Bahubali. Um, mm -hmm. But again, like they make content first and foremost for themselves. Bahubali was a story for themselves. Dangal mm -hmm. was a story for themselves. It just resonated in China and other parts of the world, right? So, you know, at least to my mind, it's first and foremost, you have to find the love within your own community. Once mm -hmm. you've defined your love within your community, if other people enjoy that as well, then that's fantastic. I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident um, the, the the creators of Squid Game did not create that with the Western world in mind. They created that no. for themselves. Right. That's a good segue, actually, because my next question to you is, what do you think, how do you, how do you think, actually, a local story can be made for an international audience? Or should it be or can it be? I guess I, kn I know what you're saying with Squid Game. They probably made it for themselves. Doing. You don't I think? think it, it, for, the authenticity of the story that you know, requires you to make it in its original form, right? Like, how, how do you tell a Lagos story for the global market? It's a Lagos story. Like, it, it just is a Lagos story. Again, same way as that, how do you tell a, you can't tell a Sudanese story for the Nigerian audience. They won't right. get it. There's nuances right. that you won't get. There's things yeah. that will be like, why that's a bit odd. Like, again, so, you know, I, I always use the perfect example of, um, like, Walking Dead, uh, not Walking Dead, it was, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Breaking Bad. So um, Breaking Bad, they tell you you have cancer. Your first thought is, let me go and do drug dealing, make some moves and get some money for my family. <laughs> if that was in Nigeria, if that was in Nigeria, that one, that no one would understand that story. You know why? Because if they tell you you have cancer, God forbid, it will never happen. Before you know it, prayer warriors yeah. in town, we're at the church lying down, we're doing fasting, <laughs> we're doing all the medical stuff, but we're praying. Again, like, it's like you can't, you can't disconnect. Right. The settings from that reality so you having a nollywood story or you having an Nigerian story which doesn't have religion in it then it's not a true yeah. story like right. it's just not a true story right. like and that story no, is right. every if you go to london if there is a nigerian story with nigerians in london and there is not god in those stories and religion is not a big part of that 
then it's not a true story as far as I'm concerned. Same with the US. So for me, it's like wherever Nigerians are, they're still Nigerians. Our issues are still our issues. And I think, right. you know, you need to, in order to, in order to tell a story, it needs to be authentic. And I think the more authentic the stories are, the better the res- um, the, the um, uh, people um, sort of resonate with it. And I think that's really important, authenticity. And that's why I see a lot of stories essentially contrived with the global mood, our audience in mind. They always suck, man. They're just really trash. <laughs> You're like, I don't want them. Okay, so then we've got a question from the audience. Jason, how do you identify opportunities and what are the tips for achieving set goals? So I guess... When you're looking at like these filmmakers and you're seeing all these people, how do you identify that you're like, yep, yeah, this is this is a good one? You know, there must be you must meet loads of people. How do you decide when you're meeting someone? So I'm, I, I, it's for me, it's perfect. Hey, my, just go and talk to my wife. So, <laughs> so that, my first talk <laughs> to my wife. Now. But you know, like so, you know what 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 Mary has done with rock. I think people will never fully understand because I don't think she'll ever fully tell her story, right? So, you know, if you go back seven years nollywood is essentially dominated by men it was the people the marketers who had the capital they essentially hired the um producers to actually do the work and these guys were just like people who sold dvds they were just traders like they didn't really read the scripts they didn't really care it was just, for them it was just like give me something to put on this disc and let me just go and sell it and that, those were the times where it was just like okay i want mercy johnson let me go and do a movie with mercy johnson okay wait hold on this you know um van vicker is uh, is a very very um uh, proper, let me go and do a movie for Van Vicker. They weren't really thinking of storytelling or anything like that. So obviously Mary being on set, she realized very quickly that the people who actually created the content were the people who worked underneath the marketers, right? The actual producers. And right. they were overwhelmingly women. But right. there was no one to fund them and to back them. So when when we first started um, like Rock, you know, she first went to the marketers and they were just playing games of us trying to screw us over, all kinds of crazy stuff, right? And then she realized, well, actually, do you know what? Like, I'm giving you the courtesy of trying to do a deal with you. If you don't want to do a deal with me, let me essentially empower your the people who actually do the work. So she essentially took an entire layer of people who were basically created in Hollywood that we know, who had fantastic stories, and essentially enabled them to create their own stories and just basically finance them and work to them to kind of improve their craft, etc. So what she realized is that someone who can tell a good, you know, talent is talent is talent, right? If someone is a good actor, like you don't have to, you don't have to teach. They they basically like they, they they've got it right. If you're a bad actor, no matter how much teaching you get, like you just won't get it, right? Um, so she's able to identify talent because she's been in the industry for almost 20 years, right? Um, mm-hmm. She understands what talent looks like. But a good, the talent has to be consistent as well. It's not just about, oh, I'm a talented person as well. You know what? Can you actually, you know, complete a project on time and the budget? Can, are you like a pleasure to work with? Can you work with other people? So, you know, currently Rock works with about 80 independent producers. Um, it's a lot of people, but it's a family, right? And she supports them. She works with them on a constantly basis. She tries to improve their craft. Um, and ultimately, like, you know, they they essentially, like, owe a lot of their first starts in the industry to, to her and our, our ability to finance them. And I, I think the key thing is that, again, you know, you've seen this trend that Nollywood is overwhelmingly dominated by women now. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's women first. And that, that wasn't the case seven years ago. And I definitely know that, like, you know, Mary's been a big part of that. And I think that's a good thing. Because ultimately, like, who watches Nollywood? It's overwhelmingly women, right? So again, there's the nuances of, of women telling a story that a man would just never understand, right? Or tell it in such a weird way um, that it would just be like, well, this definitely wasn't written by, uh, like, you know, someone who understands this particular thing. Um, yeah. So I think identifying is just being on the streets. You can't you can't sit in a corporate office, you know, in Amsterdam or in, in the US or in London and be like, yo, I'm doing Nollywood and I'm allocating stuff. And that, you know, if you do that, then you end up with really weird, you know, contrived content. So you need to go into the streets. You need to go and find the talent. You know, you need to go and be willing to do the hard work to unearth new talent. Um, and f- that's from the... Um, and talent's not just obviously in front of the camera. It's not just producers. It's sound engineers. It's, you know, DOPs. It's like a whole bunch. There's a whole sort of full stack of um, of talent which needs to be unearthed for Nollywood to basically continue to be strong, right? And I think that that is a challenge that when when when, when Mary goes to other countries, she, there's, not, there's not the... the the, the talent is not there. There's not like, oh, let me go and get like five directors. There's not like five, 10, 20 directors to choose from. There's not five, 10, 20 sound engineers to choose from. So she ends up having to bring people from Nigeria to actually go, you know, to Senegal or to Cameroon or to Ghana to essentially help support, to help right. to support creation of content. Um, right. So I think like, you know, talent understands talent. Um, you know, Mary just spends all of her time trying to unearth that. And that's why essentially I believe she has a significant edge in the content and creation, you know, in the last decade or so. 
Jason, um, you are Mary's biggest. I don't even know Mary, and I feel like I know her now. I feel like I just, <laughs> not, I just, can we bring Mary into the room? Mary, if Mary was in Senegal, <laughs> you know, I can just in. You know, you, you usually like so. You know, when I glanced at the, when I when I when I glanced at what the kind of questions there would be, I was like, you know what, this is not for me. This is, this is Mary. And like every time I tell her, like. I had a conversation. All I'm doing is essentially like paraphrasing the conversations we have at home. <laughs> essentially, like her. most of these conversations I have, most of these conversations, it should be her, but she just doesn't. She doesn't like. She doesn't really like yeah, being she's, she's, not, she's a private yeah. person. She's not really like. Yeah, she doesn't really like that. So very un-Nigerian as well. <laughs> very like. <laughs> you you want to talk? You want to just like? Do your <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're getting close to the end. I wanted to ask you um, for tips and tricks, I guess, um, for people watching this, anyone who wants to make films and also wants to invest in films. What would be, I guess, your advice that you'd give to someone who wants to make a film and wants it to reach a wide audience? So actually, what's fantastic today is that social media has its fallbacks, but it also is very powerful on Earth in talent. So um, there's a lady, Bisola, um, who was on Big Brother, but before she was on Big Brother, Mary was featuring her in some movies. How did she find her? You know, she used to do these skits on um, on, on Instagram, right? And on, on, on YouTube. Um, so if you are talented in front of the camera, just do skits, people will find you. Like, you know, over time as you build an audience, people will find you, right, one. Two is that, again, you can also um, you can also show craft. You know, things are so inexpensive that you can actually create very, um, like, super low budget, or, uh, no low budget, micro budget, um, you know, content to kind of, like, showcase what you can do, right? And I think in the end, hey, I'm a filmmaker, this is what I've done, like, is one thing. But if it's, like, you know what, I've taken the time and I've got some friends together and I've actually, you know, created maybe 15 or 20, you know, three or four minute, just like scene by scene, short stories, just to kind of show that, look, this is what I can do. And I think ultimately that's how people, um, that's how people find themselves, right? So again, like, you know, you know, you know Mary, when, when she wants to come to London to do a series or something, um, you know, she'll, she'll put a call out for local filmmakers. And if you're just like, hey, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a filmmaker, but you have nothing to show for it, then that, that's, that's not the way the world works anymore. I think it's also, um, and, and this is unfortunate, but it is the way it is. If people aren't trying to, if you're not, if you're not making yourself like visible, um, you know, filmmaking is very relationship driven. So if you have worked with other filmmakers that Mary has worked with, then, um, you know, she'd be more likely to look, uh, to sort of, uh, to, 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 to look at that. I think one of the things that she's pretty harsh on, and I think it's a bit too harsh, but she's, you know, experiences taught her otherwise, you send her a cold script, she won't even open an email. Like you send her a cold script idea, she'll never open it. Because you know, there's so many stories out there. And we've seen this right. quite a few times that there's so many stories out there. Let's say you right. emailed Mary like three years ago and then you saw something which was similar to your own. Before you know it, you're, you're on social media, like, like these, you know, these rock people stole my thing, et cetera, et cetera. So her, her ability to sort of like take a cold um, sort of inbound contact is zero. She just has never done that. So it's usually right. like you, you've worked with someone that she's worked with or you she's discovered you somehow, et cetera. But again, like, you know, she's trying to discover people. So she's she's out there looking for talent. Her team's out there looking for talent. Um, it's just a question of like, how serious are you? You know, I, I find that like for every thousand people, like I want to be in the film industry, like 10 of them are really serious about it. Right. Like, you know, it's like they, they, they like the idea of like the fame and everything that attracts, but the actual hard work behind that, like they, they're, not really, they're not really about that life. <laughs> I love that. I'm not really about that life. That's a good way to end it. I guess my takeaway from that is that, you know, for everyone watching, for the hundreds of people that are watching, is that as much as we complain about Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all these things that we complain about, they are your creative portfolios for Absolutely. video, for film, for photos. You should be using it and you should go on there and you should be like, oh, this is their style. This is their edge. This is what they're passionate about it's an online portfolio and you should always use it. It's so, democratized. Said, it made it, it's put it in the hands of everybody, right? Yeah, I say it all the time between LinkedIn and Instagram. I'm like, that's how I have a documentary. That's how I make films because yeah. of those two platforms. So I think that people Absolutely. need to be smart about that and be able to do it. Um, Jason and Mary, when she's not here, but kind of here. Um, thank you so <laughs> <She's> much. Here. <laughs> she's here <That's> scared. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so amazing to talk to you. Um, I've taken away a lot thank of that you. and I hope everyone else has. If you guys are watching and you want to make a film or you want to invest in a film, make sure that you're always aware that people are watching. I'd say that's the biggest thing that I've taken away from this. Actually, one last thing. So actually, so my village is like, make something and just tag people. You know, you can tag someone. She may see the tag of you creating like a video. She may look at it. 
we share videos back and forth all of the time. So if you tag a, um, if you have an interesting piece of content, just tag her. Um, if you tag me, I'm essentially her executive assistant, so I'll, I'll probably get it to her as well. <laughs> so. Exactly. Do everything you can do. Make yourself visible. I'd say that's the most important thing. Make yourself visible. Thank that's you so free. much. Jason. That's basically free. That's free today. Because Instagram is on your phone. We're on it anyway, so you might as well do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for the chat. I really enjoyed chatting to you, and I hope everyone else has too. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.